Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Right? Yes, it's Saturday. I love the weekend. It's just such a glorious time to be alive. Oh, my. Oop. There we go. A little bit better in case I lean back. Hey, Roz, how are you doing this morning? And welcome to everybody watching this VOD later, whatever day you're watching it. Um, not bad, not bad. You? Good, I'm doing well. I'm very happy it's Saturday morning. Doing some Latin, that's always good. We are um, finished with the first declension. We have learned it. We remember what it does, I'm sure. And we have underneath the cam uh, the first declension endings. So we have our little cheat sheet there. I got rid of the vocab pages um, to lighten it up a little bit uh, so we could see the text better. In part because I haven't... Yeah, we definitely remember it. I know. Um, I got rid of the vocab in part so we could see the text better and in part because I didn't do any preparation for this week. So I don't know what vocab we're going to need. So we're just all going to be blind. Don't fall asleep, Punch. Actually, you can fall asleep. I don't care. Uh, if you are watching this later... Um, to seriously practice your Latin. Um, what we're going to do today is start with these questions at the end of this lesson. Um, the questions can be answered back in section 61. Up here we have, or 62, sorry. Up here we have uh, the answers. Uh, so I'm not going to give you the answers here. We're just going to read through the questions together to refresh our mind. Uh, and if you are doing this on your own, uh, you can pause and look up the answers uh, and do a little test for yourself that way to make sure you can learn things. Again, if you want <clears throat> to get this PDF that I'm using, uh, you can go to textkit.com uh, and look for Benjamin L. Dugis, Dugs, Latin for Beginners. That's the text that I'm using. Um, after we read through these questions and try to remind ourselves about some basic things, then we will go to uh, the next two sections where, we're, where we will learn a little bit more about adjectives and then the second declension or the O declension uh, another group of nouns that has its own set of endings. So this set is only for the A declension, or the first declension. All right, so let's just read some questions. Get used to some Latin here. Number one. Quis cum agricula in casa habitat? Who? That's quis. Uh, so the question words will not probably be familiar. Uh, habitat lives cum agricola with the farmer in casa, in house, or in his house, more than likely. Quid bona filia agricolae parat? So quid is going to be the accusative of the question word, which means it is the direct object <coughs> of the verb. It receives the action. Uh, the verb being parat. Bona filia is in the nominative. So what does the good daughter prepare for the farmer? Agricolae being in the dative case. The dative case. Number three, quem agricola laudat. Again, uh, that quem is going to be accusative, so the direct object. Whom does the farmer praise? Number four. Vocatne filia agricolae galinas ad canam. Uh, the ne means that we're asking a question. That's all that part of the word does. So does the daughter of the farmer, filia agricolae, call the hens to dinner? Yes, she does. I was very confused about that sentence, so 
I remember the answer to that. Number five, cuius filia es grata domini. Cuius is the genitive, so it shows possessive of whom. Uh, so the daughter, whose daughter is what we say in English, uh, whose daughter is pleasing to the mistress, domini. Again, the dative for domini. Uh, the dative and genitive singular is always tricky, though. You might have to take a moment to think about that. And then number six, qui domina pecunium dat. Qui is the dative. So to whom does the mistress give money? Pecuniam, that am um being accusative, the object of the verb. Woo. So let's review again. The nominative is the subject of a sentence. The genitive shows possession and some other things, but we use of for that. The dative is the indirect object, has an interest in the sentence, so to or for is used for the dative, not to be confused with other uses of to, like motion. Accusative is a direct object of the verb and some prepositions. An ablative is almost everything else, uh, mostly location, separation, um, time uh, has many uses that use a uh, preposition, but many uses that do not have a preposition. So we have to learn as we go the different specific things that ablatives can and cannot do. Um, so, and that just takes time. Um, and it will be covered under part three constructions uh, in this. Uh, book, I'm sure. But I guess we'll find out when we get there. All right. I'll pause for a moment um, in case anybody has any questions about the basics of those cases, what they do. While we at pause for that moment, I, I got to go grab something. All right, if you're watching this later, feel free to leave comments below with questions and I should get notification. Uh, but let's keep going. <clears throat> Lesson seven. Uh, so I'm going to follow very carefully what is written here. Uh, the reason for that being this is a very difficult concept for many students. So I want to make sure I take it very slowly. I follow along with what the how the book phrases it, and then I can answer any questions uh, and try to make it a bit more logical for people. And the trick, the trick is the adjectives. It it starts to make sense once you learn more, but it can be very difficult to grasp at first. So it's okay if this is hard. So. As the book says, we have been using adjectives and nouns together, and there's an agreement in case and number, and they also agree in gender. So even up here, when we're talking in number two about the bona filia, the good daughter, right? adjectives always agree with the noun they modify in gender, number, and case. So bona is feminine singular nominative. It has a feminine singular nominative ending because that's what philia is. And they give the example of silva, silva magna, with a feminine adjective agreeing with a feminine noun. Okay, see, that seems easy at first. Right? Adjectives agree with their nouns in gender, number, and case. 
So feminine adjectives in A look just like the feminine nouns in A. Domina bona, dominai bonai, if you talk about of the good mistress. If you want to give something to the good mistress, dominai bonai. If the good mistress is the direct object, domina bonam. All right? That all seems fine. That all seems fine and dandy. Puella Mala, the bad girl. Ancilla Parwa, the little maid. I'm kind of using a mix of classical and ancient pronunciation of Latin, by the way. and I Or classical and church Latin. So I apologize for that. Fortuna Magna, great fortune. Right? They all... Decline together. The adjective is always going to match the noun that it modifies. But that doesn't mean that they look the same. And this is the tripping point. Adjectives don't just magically get whatever ending the noun has. Adjectives also have certain sets of endings. And so in 67, um, we have an example of an irregular noun, dea, goddess. And philia. Oh, I forgot that philia was irregular until just now, but it makes sense um, in the context of Latin. <clears throat> so these two irregular nouns, goddess, dea, and philia, daughter, in the um, dative and ablative plural, See, they're supposed to have that I-S in the dative and the ablative plural. You can see in the chart beneath me. But they have abus instead. So instead of deis, it's deabus. Instead of filiis, it's filiabus. Okay. They're just irregular nouns. They have some irregular endings. It happens in all languages. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> in Latin, it actually makes a lot of sense. Because there's another noun that looks very similar to it, and in those cases they would look the same. And so Latin has this alternate way, so you know if you're talking about gods versus goddesses, or daughters versus sons, in the date of an ablative plural. Uh, so it just came up with a way to distinguish it from other words. So if we look at goddess in the plural, dei boni, Dearum bonarum, but then deabus bonis. Deabus bonis. So, they do not look the same. But, that adjective and that noun are both feminine, plural, dative. So they don't have to look the same. They just have to both be feminine, plural, dative. Then in cusive deas bonas, they happen to look the same again. Ablative deabus bonis. Again, they look different, but they are the same. They're both ablative, feminine, plural. So adjectives, um, one group of adjectives, for its feminine endings, it uses these endings, these first declension endings, but only for feminine nouns. Once we start learning masculine nouns, we'll have to learn the masculine and neuter endings, and that's when it starts getting a bit confusing. So right now, just hold on to the concept. Adjectives match the noun they're going to modify in gender, number, and case, but they don't have to look the same. They just have to be the same gender, number, and case, but they don't have to look the same. <clears throat> That's confusing in the abstract. It's way better in practice. But later on today, after this section, we'll be getting to the second declension or the O declension of nouns. We'll learn some new noun endings and be able to mix and match a little bit better. And hopefully, it will make sense. Hopefully. It's very tricky at first. All right. Now we have a section on Latin word order. I think we've already gotten a pretty good idea that Latin has a very flexible word order uh, because it does change the ending. Um, 
English, we can change the word order to change up emphasis a little bit. But it usually comes off sounding really weird. Um, so here they say, try the effect of reading the sentence by putting special force on my daughter dinner farmers. So he's suggesting simply reading the emphasis differently. My daughter is getting dinner for the farmers. 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 Different sense based on where we speak it. In Latin, they can do that by putting a different word first in the sentence. Change word order we can. Sound 900 years old, we will. Exactly. Like, it makes sense. It just... You know, it's just really bizarre. Okay. So in a Latin sentence, I'm reading this uh, section one here. The most emphatic place is the first. Next in importance is the last. And the weakest point is in the middle. This is very important to remember. Um, one, and one reason why the verb is usually last. The verb is usually pretty important to the sentence. Um, and it's also a helpful way for the listener to know that you've reached the end of the sentence. Okay, that was the verb. Now I can put the whole sentence together. The subject is the most important word and place first. Usually the verb is the next and place last. Right? It makes sense. The other words of the sentence stand between the two in order of importance. So usually it is the subject and then any modifiers of the subject. So those genitive words. It's Polish also subject, object, verb. It's very common in other things. So, Polish did not invent that one. Okay. Um, and then the indirect object. So, not the direct object of the verb, but the indirect and then direct adverbs, non or very quickly, blah, 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 and then the verb. Reverse Polish notation is where you write arithme arithmetic expression with the operator last. So you'd write seven, eight times. What? I have never heard of that. That's insane. But, you know, I guess that's okay, if you know what's happening. <laughs> uh. Alright, changes from the normal word order are frequent and due to the desire for throwing emphasis upon a different word or phrase. Alright. So what do they say under two? Possessive pronouns and modifying genitives normally stand after their nouns. Mention that. When placed before the noun, they are emphatic. So, philia mea, my daughter versus mea philia, gives emphasis to mea. The book that we are using <coughs> is Benjamin L. Doug's Latin for Beginners, available there on TextKit. Uh, I believe it's heavily designed to uh, gear us up for Caesar, if I recall correctly from the introduction. Never needs parenthesization because operator and operand order makes all the difference. Three, four, plus eight times is different from three, four, eight times plus. Huh. I'm like kind of confused, but also very intrigued. And I'm going to talk to my mathematician friend about this. Oh man, it's been so long since I've thought about math, that's crazy. My brain's just kind of breaking right now. <laughs> Alright. 
So if adjectives or genitives that normally go um, second, they then go first. Oh, that's cool that you teach math. Um, I guess it's just used in Poland. So probably don't see it that much, but Roz will provide more details. All right. Blah, 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 blah. Adjective place before its noun is more emphatic than when it follows. We've said that. Okay, when grade emphasis is desired, the adjective is separated from its noun by other words. So, yeah, I really like this list of emphasis here. Uh, so, filia mea kasam parwam nanam hot. My daughter does not love the small house. Okay. Pretty normal sentences. Both adjectives, maya and parwam, are following their noun. Uh, so no special emphasis. Filia maya parwam kasam nanamat. My daughter doesn't love this small house. Uh, so this time parwam, the adjective before the noun, making it more emphatic. And then parwam filia maya kasam nanamat. My daughter does not love the small house, the parwam was moved to the very beginning of the sentence, making it the most important word and very emphatic. Interrogative words usually stand first, the same as in English. So again, quis, quid, quem, all our who, whose, how, usually first. And the verb to be, the copula, is of so little importance that it frequently does not stand last, but maybe plays wherever it sounds well. It may also just be entirely left out, because it's to be. Whatever. You can imply it. Oh, look at all these words. Note the order of the words in these sentences. Pick out those that are emphatic. Long guy non santua wea. Your roads are not long. Ways... I don't know how they want us to interpret we, I here. Sunt ne tu by no why in mea casa. Are there new tunnels in my house? There are not. Nun sunt. I'm not 100% sure what tu by is supposed to mean there, so we're going with it. I should look it up. Let's look at, it's like I want to look at one that is emphatic. Uh, let's look at number four. Termites. Maybe. A new termites. Right. Now tai altas et latas amant aquas. So now tai is our subject, it's the nominative plural. Amant is our verb, but it's not last, right? Aquas has been put last, so it's emphatic, that accusative plural, emphatic. The adjectives for it are in the regular position, in the middle of the sentence, altas et latas, uh, deep and broad, um, but separated from its noun, so there's... <laughs> There's a lot of emphasis on the water here and how the sailors love it. So the sailors love deep and broad seas, let's say. So very emphatic on what the sailors love. All right. There's a lot of flexibility in it. Uh, so take a break now, stretch a little bit. <sighs> Review vocab and grammar as you need to. That's the first declension. And just some guidelines about adjectives, word order, and these things. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, the second or O declension now, once I have some tea.
Yeah, and the tuba is still trumpet, so never mind. That word didn't change from Latin to English. Well, I mean, it did. It's a trumpet versus a tuba, but I'm going to have Punch explain that one. All right. The second declension. Yay, lesson nine. So we're on lesson nine out of, I can't remember how many, 70 something? We've learned the A declension, the first declension, right here. As Benjamin writes here, there's a total of five declensions. So these are noun families. Each noun belongs to one family. There's a few irregular ones, of course. We've actually already talked about philia and dea, how they have two irregular forms. But most nouns have their one form and they're totally happy. So you need to remember when you learn your vocab, which declension a noun belongs in. You can tell that from the genitive singular. The genitive singular of every declension is different. So if you memorize the nominative and genitive form, you will know which declension the noun belongs in. So for first declension, it's A-E, pronounced I. Uh, for the second declension, the genitive ending is a long I. E, pronounced E. It, it always just makes it sound a little bit weird when you do it this way. The nominative singular for the second declension changes quite a bit. Um, as it says in 71, the nominative may end in a U-S or an E-R, sometimes an I-R. That's really not very common, though. Uh, and then the U-M, if it's neuter. So U-S, E-R, and I-R are all masculine, uh, and the U-M is a neuter. So there's a total of three genders in Latin, feminine, masculine, and neuter. Second declension is almost all uh, masculine or neuter. The only exception being um, nouns for types of trees. Trees are feminine in Latin. So even though most trees or many trees, I don't, I don't know the data for percentages here, but many trees are in the second declension, but are feminine. So you do see them sometimes. All right. The U.S. is kind of the easy and the usual one. And it's probably the one that's always, like, made fun of. Like, when people make up Latin words, they just add, like, a U.S. to it and, and call it good. So that should be very familiar. So dominus, domini, domino, dominum, domino. Domini, dominorum, dominis, dominos, dominis. Oh, I got a thing. I have to wait until it pops up here to tell what that thing is, but I heard an alert. Then pluralize. Oh, thanks for the follow. Appreciated. Pluralize the E or EE, -E, depending on how little someone knows of Latin. Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes it's right. Right? It definitely is a plural form. Um, now, if you compare, yeah, Latin is great. And I actually like, even though I don't remember all these vocab words like tuba, um, I used to teach Latin. So I'm kind of doing this for um, anybody who wants to hang out and learn some Latin. So hopefully this will help you. Uh, definitely feel free to hit me with questions. Uh, as we go through. If um, <laughs> you're to learn English, that's fair. <laughs> my my grammar in English did improve a lot from learning Latin, so you're not wrong. All right, so the second declension um, is called, as you saw before, the O declension sometimes, 
what we learned previously was the A declension. And so you'll see there's actually a fair bit of similarities between the two declensions. Uh, just if you replace the A in the first declension with an O or a U in the second. Um, so the accusative singular, we have the vowel and the M. In the ablative plural, we just have the long vowel. In the genitive plural, we have the vowel and rum. We have is in all the dative, ablative, singular, and plural. So there are a fair bit of similarities between the first and second declension. It just linguistically changed um, because of the A versus the U sound. Comparing the masculine to the neuter um, in the second declension is even more similar, of course. The two exceptions being the nominative, where the neuter pilum there is a U-M, and then the neuter plural has an A in the nominative and accusative plural. Pila, pila for spears. This is a thing that neuter nouns do in Greek and Latin. They always look the same in nominative and accusative, and the plural always has an A in it. This is, this is what it is. It's because neuter case is just, it's this thing. They don't care about it. They don't care enough to give it different endings. It's very strange, but very cool. Um, so let neuter nouns be your friends like that. But otherwise, it looks the same as the masculine form, the long I, the O, and the O. You will know, uh, we'll note here that the vocative in the singular is included, and the vocative for the masculine is domine with an E. Uh, this is the only time when it's not the same as a nominative. The masculine singular, second declension. The only time the vocative is different from the nominative. So, note that well. Uh, but otherwise, it's just a matter of memorizing these endings. Us e o um o e ordem e so sees. Or um e o um o a ordem is a is. All right, let's see if they have anything useful to say here. The masculine and the neuters have the same endings, except in the nominative singular and nominative and accusative plural. Oh, mouse. Exactly. Oh, moose. Moose? It's probably a neuter, so it's probably just oh, moose. M-U-S. I'll have to look that up to be sure I'm telling you the right thing. The vocative singular of the words in the second declension, U-S, ends in a short E. And again, he is pointing out that the first declension and the second declension actually have a lot of similarities. Uh, so let that be helpful for you. Uh, so he, he wrote some rules for this. All right, the vocative is like the nominative, except in the second declension, U.S. singular. The nominative, accusative, and vocative neuter nouns are always the same, and the plural ends in A. Every declension is this miraculous thing that neuter nouns do. The accusative singular of masculine feminine ends in M, and the accusative plural in S, right? Uh, dominas versus dominos. The dative and ablative plural are always alike, right? That long I, S. Dominis, dominis. Final I and O are always long. Final A is short, except in the ablative singular. I never even thought about that, but there we go. Good to know. S make a little note of that. So what are we saying here? Lesbia est bona. Lesbia is good. Lesbia est ancila, or anquila. I should 
try to be classical here. Lesbia is a maidservant, correct. Lesbia is also the uh, code name of Catullus's um, girlfriend, uh, lover, lady. So you'll probably see her name a lot. We have learned, did we, that bona, when used as here in the predicate, is to describe the subject as a predicate adjective. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, so predicate nouns and predicate adjectives are in the same case as the subject, a.k.a. the nominative. Right? It's that whole code name. Exactly, it's her code name. Is that what I said? That probably is what I said. Pen name? Um, secret name? The, the name that he made up to replace his lover's real name? I, I think there's actually a word to use for this, and I just can't think of it right now. <laughs> code name. We're just going to go with code name. Uh, so again, with the verb to be, the copulative verb, it's like an equal sign. You're going to have nominatives on both sides because you have the subject and then the predicate nominative, the predicate being the verb and the stuff that follows. So both bona and anquila are in the nominative. Oh, a little dialogue. Let me just see what else we have to do. All right, that's it. So we're just gonna do this little dialogue. Oh, there it is, right there. There's the pila, it's holding the spear, and the tuba. Little trumpet right here, all right. We haven't stopped to learn the special vocab, uh, which, you know, for the most part, it should be okay, I say, uh, extremely optimistically. But we'll go ahead and put up uh, on my side. We'll just pull up a Latin dictionary so I don't, um, lead anybody astray if I find something uh, wrong. That would be the opposite of what I want to do. All right. So Galba and Marcus are having it. Who is this? Okay, I don't know who you are. Quis, Marque, et legatus cum pilo et tuba. Legatus Galba est Sextus. Oh, that's Sextus there. So Galba asks, Who, O oh Marcus, is the legate with a spear and a trumpet? The legate, Galba, is Sextus. Ubi Sextus habitat? Where does Sextus live? In Obido Sextus cum filiabus habitat. In the town, Sextus lives with his daughters. Uh, amantne opidani sextum? I'm guessing opidani is people who live in the town. Opidani. Yep, townspeople. Good. Do the townspeople love sextus? Amant. Bless you, Punch. <sighs> Amant obidani sextum et laudant, quod magna cum constantia pugnat. Oh, the townspeople love Sextus and praise him, because, bless you, because he fights with great constancy, like firmness. Say like firmness. You're forgiven, Punch. Ubi marque est anquila tua, cur non canam parat. Where, O oh Marcus, is your maidservant? Why does she not prepare dinner? Anquila mea galba, equo legati aquam et frumentum dat. My maidservant galba gives water and fruit uh, to the... Us, us, ui, um, u, to the horse of the legate. There we go. I was like, equo legati. All right, so she's feeding the horse. That's nice of him. Her, sorry. 
Okay. Cur non serva Sextus, equum domini curat. Why does the servant of Sextus not care for the horse of his master? That's an excellent question. Sextus et servas ad murum opidi properat. Opidani bellum parat. Oh, that just got very dramatic. Sextus and his servant are hastening to the wall of the city. The citizens are preparing for war. So, apparently this is not just a happy conversation. <laughs> I think, think some stuff's about to go down with Sextus. Alright. Habitat is here translated as does live. Right. So, a reminder about the... He, so, he needs a servant, but not his horse. Well, if they're hanging out at the wall, it does sound like they're more doing defensive preparation, so he doesn't really need to be galloping about. Uh, right? That is a big twist. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. But it's Latin, so there's going to be a lot of wars and a lot of people probably getting killed. Um, so... An important note here from the author, the three possible translations of the Latin present tense, habitat, he lives, he is living, or he does live. Any of the three are perfectly good translations for the present. Um, it just depends on the context and how you want to put it into English um, and work it over. Okay. Observe the verb paro means not only to prepare, but also to prepare for, and governs the accusative case, right? As I mentioned, he prepares for war, or, sorry, the citizens, opidani bellum parant, uh, the townspeople prepare for war, um, in English, um, captures better what they're doing than the citizens prepare war. That sounds like... They prepare. I don't. I don't even know. Like, what would that mean if you prepare war? It it's very dark. <laughs> like, it sounds like you might have like be about to assassinate somebody or something. Prepare for that. That is more of what English says. All right. Uh, so now we can answer the questions uh, since we just read the story. They're get, the citizens are preparing war. They're getting ready to go to war as opposed to being ready to defend. Yes? Um, I definitely think that would be some of the sense of it. Uh, but I don't think that's all... I don't know. That's not a phrase people use, right? You prepare war. We always say prepare for, right? Anyway. I don't know. Um, so we'll wrap today by answering these questions from the conversation. Uh, I'm not going to give the answers. You guys can. Um, the answers were in what we just read. And then next time we will go back to talking about adjectives. Yay! Um, so spend the week just trying to um, remember those first and second declension endings. Uh, and do the, the vocab um, work. So... Ubi filii sexti habitant. Where do the daughters of Sextus live? Where do the daughters of Sextus live? So you can go back up and see where they live. Again, I'm not going to answer though. Quem opidani amant et laudant? Whom do the townspeople love and praise? Whom do the townspeople love and praise? Go back up. Check it out. Number three. Quid anquila equo legati dat? What does the maidservant give to the horse of the legate? That's a beautiful sentence because we have an accusative nominative, dative, and genitive all in a row. It's beautiful. Just perfectly gives all the cases to us. Except for the ablative, but we're still working on it. 
So quid anquila equo legatidat, what does the maidservant give to the horse of the legate? Number four, huius equum anquila curat, whose horse does the maidservant care for? Whose horse does the maidservant care for? Number five, quis ad muram cum sexto properat? Who hurries to the wall with sextus? Who hurries to the wall with sextus? Quid obidani parant? What do the townspeople prepare or prepare for? Quid obidani parant? What do the townspeople prepare? All right. We learned Latin today. We went through the first declension, or the second declension, rather. Sorry. Uh, so, any questions about the cases? What they do? Or the declension? Why is the second declension called the O declension? Because linguistically, that's the vowel that um, kind of ended the words. Um, so I do this once a weekend. Um, so it's usually about this time in the morning, just depending on whether I have Saturday or Sunday uh, free. Um, so I, yeah, I only go about an hour a week. We do one or two lessons um, each week, so we'll finish, um, you know, probably sometime in like October we'll finish, maybe, and then start doing some Caesar or whatever this gears us up for. Uh, so it's about 9.30 Eastern, um, and then just depends on how quickly we get through it. Uh, so... Just so I can better explain Roswaf's question, though, the O declension. Um, so every noun has a root. Um, and then that root comes together with the ending. And when the root and the ending come together, um, linguistics make things change as they do. Um, so the root vowel for the O declension is an O. Uh, so that's why we see an O in the dative and the ablative and the genitive and the accusative. That O hap changes to other things when it meets up with different endings, but that's why it's called the O declension. Just like the first declension is called the A declension because it's root has that A, um, it retains the A much more frequently than the second declension retains the O, but that's, that's essentially what it is. And we see that in modern European languages from that then, where it is very frequent that masculine words end in an O, and then the feminine forms end in an A. Amigo, amiga. Um... What are some other, I mean, there's a ton of O and A nouns, um, but I think it is the European inheritance that makes the O declension seem much more O, because <laughs> it's like, oh yes, amigo, that is a masculine, and amiga, yes, that is the feminine, the O and the A. Um... So it, it retains it there. I'm like blanking on every language, though, I know right now. So hopefully that made some sense. Um, do watch the VODs. Do leave comments if you have questions or bring them uh, in the future. But um, it'll be posted on YouTube at some point today. Thank you for watching. Good luck learning Latin try to work on these declensions. Uh, we'll have them up next time as we continue to talk about adjectives and declensions.
Yay! Are you excited? I'm excited.